Ich möchte Sie sehr herzlich begrüßen im Namen des Forschungskollegs Humanwissenschaften der Goethe-Universität in Bad Homburg bei Frankfurt und im Namen des Vorbereitungsteams von Herrn Professor Puhle vom Fachbereich 3 der Goethe-Universität und äh, Pierre Monet, dem Direktor des IFRA, des Institut franco allemand des Sciences Historique et Sociales, ebenfalls in Frankfurt am Main. Wir haben gemeinsam diese Vorlesungsreihe ins Leben gerufen über die Perspektiven der Sozialdemokratie in Europa. Und das ist nun äh, das Ende unseres zweiten Semesters und der vierte Vortrag in unserem zweiten Semester, zu dem ich sehr herzlich begrüßen möchte. Ich wechsle nun äh, zur englischen Sprache, weil unser Referent heute Abend, den ich sehr herzlich begrüßen möchte, Herrn Professor Johann Ockhant von der École des Sautes Sciences Sociales, also EHESS in Paris, wird seinen Vortrag auf Englisch halten. Ladies and gentlemen, very welcome for this fourth lecture on the perspectives of social democracy in Europe. Um, in our summer semester, I'm very proud that Jan Ogon from the AHESS in Paris will present his thought uh, about uh, the perspectives of the Scandinavian social democracy um, under the wonderful title Scandinavian social democracy at the crossroad. What is left of the left? Um, Now I would like to ask Pierre Monet, who is with us um, from Paris, uh, like Johann Ocon, uh, both on uh, online, and I would like to ask Pierre now to give a short introduction into our speaker of tonight. Ja, guten Abend, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, vielen Dank, Matthias, und ich darf Sie auch herzlich begrüßen und willkommen heißen zu diesem letzten Vortrag unserer Reihe vor dem Sommer. Als wir zusammen mit meinen beiden Freunden und Kollegen Matthias Lutzbachmann und Hans-Jürgen Puhle uns eine Art Tour d'Horizon der Lage der Sozialdemokratie in Europa ausgedacht haben, im Süden, im Osten, im Norden, was den Norden betraf, hat sich sofort der Name des geschätzten Kollegen der École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, äh, Johann Ockant, äh, äh, dann äh, an dem, im Vordergrund äh, gestellt, äh, aus einem einfachen Grund. Er ist ein der wenigen Spezialisten in Frankreich, äh, der äh, heutigen äh, äh, politischen äh, Lage dieser äh, skandinavischen Länder Uh, Johann Ockant, uh, bonsoir Johann, merci beaucoup d'être avec nous uh, ce soir. Uh, Johann Ockant ist, uh, ist uh, Politikwissenschaftler. Uh, seit 2006 ist er Maître de Conférence, uh, Privatdozent, wenn man so will, an der École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales und uh, gleichzeitig und parallel dazu uh, Associate uh, Professor an dem Institut uh, d'Études Politiques, Sciences Po, wie man auf Französisch sagt, in Paris. Davor hatte ihn uh, seine Laufbahn an mehreren Stationen geführt darunter äh, Princeton in ähm, den Vereinigten Staaten. Äh, wie ich sagte, äh, er hat äh, in seinen wissenschaftlichen äh, äh, Gebieten, Interessen und äh, Schwerpunkten zwei äh, Säule, wenn man so will, die Analyse der äh, politischen Verhältnisse und äh, der politischen Entwicklung in äh, Skandinavien und äh, parallel dazu und äh, vergleichenderweise eine äh, breite Forschung der verschiedenen 
Systeme äh, der Sozialversicherung, äh, der sozialen Deckung in den äh, europäischen Demokratien mit Schwerpunkt auf Skandinavien, aber auch dazu mit einer vergleichenden Perspektive und Analyse im Besonderen zur Lage in Frankreich. Seine Seminare, seine Vorlesungen ähm, äh, führen immer die beiden Bereiche zusammen. Also das heißt Fokus auf Skandinavien, aber immer äh, mit einem Vergleich äh, zu äh, anderen Situationen, im Besonderen in Frankreich, und äh, immer, was zum Beispiel die äh, System de Santé, also das heißt äh, Gesundheitswesen, äh, Deckung äh, der Armut äh, und so weiter. Also Sie sehen, äh, er ist äh, heute Abend der kompetenteste äh, Wissenschaftler, um uns äh, darüber zu referieren. Äh, ich möchte äh, schließen äh, mit zwei seiner Hauptpublikationen in einer langen äh, Reihe, äh, Beide auf Französisch, weil äh, bei uns in Frankreich äh, gehören diese beiden äh, Werke zu Klassikern, wenn man sich äh, äh, an äh, Skandinavien interessiert. Und zwar Les démocraties äh, scandinaves des systèmes politiques äh, exceptionnels, Fragezeichen, äh, erschienen 2013 in Paris und äh, Les transformations des systèmes de parti dans les démocraties euh, occidentales, le modèle du parti cartel en question euh, bei den presse de Sciences Po euh, 2008 euh, und noch weitere natürlich Publikationen. Ich werde da aber zu lang und wir freuen uns. Euh, nous nous réjouissons beaucoup, Johan, de t'écouter maintenant et tu as la parole. Merci. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Uh, merci. Uh, thank you for the invitation to, uh, tonight. Uh, I'm sorry I, I cannot speak uh, in German uh, today, although it so happens that I'm married to a German citizen, but I have not uh, yet mastered uh, enough German to be able to speak in a conference like this one, uh, uh, although I understood quite a lot of what you said, uh, Pierre. Um, Okay, so yeah, once again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to to um, uh, receive this invitation and uh, and uh, and talk about the situation of Scandinavian social democracy uh, today. This is a quite large uh, subject potentially because it covers uh, uh, four up to five countries if we include uh, the Nordic neighbor of, of Finland. But I will. Uh, mostly focused today on three uh, uh, countries, uh, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, and uh, say a few words on Finland and Iceland in, in passing. Um, <clears throat> so let me, let me start uh, um, by saying that uh, Scandinavia, as you know, is home of the, some of the strongest social democratic movements in the world, perhaps uh, with a very long experience of power. Uh, that um, to a certain extent has led to a quasi-equation between the parties and the regimes. Uh, uh, and we, we usually speak of uh, Nordic social democratic regimes as if you know, there was only one, country, one party that had been in, in power there. Uh, and it's, it's clear that these uh, uh, social democratic parties have left a very, very strong imprint on the political history of uh, of these countries. I will get back to this history in a minute very briefly, but let me just begin with, uh, with uh, uh, the current situation uh, of um, social democratic parties in, in this region in a context in which traditional left parties are not doing so well. Although uh, in this uh, series of lectures that you have hosted, uh, I guess you have uh, seen that uh, you know, maybe if the French uh, Socialist Party is in full disarray right now, uh, we have witnessed over the last uh, years quite interesting and unexpected stories of kind of a revival in different countries of Europe, uh, even if the scene itself is still quite unstable. I mean, there's the British Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn with its uh, sudden membership explosion and uh, uh, and the rise of uh, many different uh, movements in a, in a new constellation 
that, that uh, leaned very much to the left of the party, even if uh, to a certain extent it was um, short-lived or stopped by Brexit. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it remains to be seen what will be the development of, uh, of this uh, new, new labor, so to speak. Uh, there was also the Spanish uh, Socialist Party of Pedro Sanchez that managed to build a coalition uh, government with Podemos, also on the basis of a, a more leftist uh, platform. It's also hit the wall uh, in, in some ways, and uh, it would be interesting to, to follow later developments in, in this area. The best success would probably be the Portuguese uh, story with a historical coalition on the left uh, since 2015 and a recent performance of 47% in 2019. Uh, and here again with a program that is also uh, leaning more to the left uh, than, than before. Um, uh, so that's you know a few examples that you've probably been uh, going through uh, uh, in, the, in the lecture series. Uh, but uh, uh, that can help also uh, put the Scandinavian situation in context. So the Scandinavian or Nordic situation is that we have right now three uh, social democratic governments out of five possible, if we include Finland. So we had, uh, after the Danish election uh, in 2019, the government of uh, Mette Frederiksen, uh, who... Um, uh, is based on a, which is based on a coalition, uh, as usual in, in Denmark. Uh, in the, after the, the Finnish elections of 2019, there was also a social democratic government uh, based on a coalition, and uh, um, there was a change of uh, prime minister in the, in, in the process uh, with uh, um, Sana Marin, who uh, took over. Uh, after a predecessor and uh, became one of the youngest uh, prime minister in the world on this occasion. And there's, there's finally um, the coalition government be between the Greens and so social, democracy, social democracy in Sweden since 2018 um, with uh, Prime Minister Stefan Löfven, uh, who is um, heading this, uh, this government. Uh, and then in Norway, uh, you have um, a right-wing uh, government uh, based on the Conservative uh, Party and also a coalition with the Christian Democratic Party that used to be also in alliance with the more uh, ra radical right-wing party, the, Pro the Progress Party. Uh, but uh, that party uh, uh, stopped uh, being part of the coalition. Uh, and in Iceland, we have a strange coalition of uh, the most uh, leftist uh, uh, party and um, was almost the most right-wing party, the Independence Party, uh, together in a, in a joint platform uh, under uh, the leadership of uh, the Prime Minister uh, 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 Katrin Jakobsdottir. Uh, so different situations, but um, it kind of looks good uh, in a way because you have uh, three uh, social uh, democratic coalition governments uh, in, in the region. Um, I would say that it looks good, but only from a, from a distance. And if we, uh, if we look uh, further uh, in, into, we go into the details, then we see that maybe the situation is not so uh, rosy. Um, <clears throat> So uh, in the title of this uh, talk, I, I used the traditional pun, what's, what's left of the left. And, and I, I should start maybe with what's left of the, the parties and, and then turn to what's left of their ideology or program. Um, so just um, some elements as a kind of historical background um, and to, well, to, to say that, um, uh, among the, well, uh, um, the Social Democratic Party of, of, uh, of Sweden and Norway have been among the, the democratic world record holders in terms of longevity in, in office. Uh, they've been uh, 
They've been uh, very, very dominant uh, parties since the 1930s. Um, um, and uh, uh, they enjoyed a share of the popular vote that exceeded uh, 40% until at least the early 1970s and sometimes much later, as in the case of, uh, of Sweden. Um, they, um, we maybe have to go back a little bit in time because uh, uh, on the surface, Denmark and Finland uh, have a, a slightly different story. The, the domination of social democracy in Denmark was uh, not as, uh, as, uh, as large and, 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 uh, and clear. Uh, and in Finland, it was uh, even less the case. But we have to remember that uh, that was in Finland. Even before Finland was an independent state, in the election of 1916 in the Grand Duchy of Finland that we had the first social democratic ma uh, majority uh, and, and the, the social democratic party at the time uh, reached a score of uh, nearly 48%. Um, so Finland was a, also an interesting story, even though as you know, uh, as a result of, uh, of the independence, there was a fiercer, uh, um, uh, civil war, and that resulted um, in um, weakening of the left, uh, uh, historical weakening of the left in, in, the, in the country. Um, <clears throat> so um, there have been ups and downs, of course, um, uh, over time. Uh, we can see here, for example, um, a, com a comparative uh, uh, graph or a picture of the electoral performance of these uh, parties in the different countries. So yellow is Sweden, red is Norway, blue is Finland, and, and brown is Denmark. And you can see that, uh, well, for from levels of uh, almost 50% uh, back in the 19, uh, in the heydays of 1950s or 60s, then um, uh, it went down. You know, gradually or sometimes with um, with you know sudden crisis, and uh, we are now uh, closer to uh, levels around 25, between 25 and 30 percent in uh, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and uh, even less than that, uh, even less than 20 percent in in Finland. Um, so uh, a clear. Uh, dwindling electoral performance so over time, uh, a downward trend that is especially clear in the last uh, 10 years, I would say, with historical uh, lows that have been reached in, in Sweden, Sweden and, and Denmark. Uh, but we have to remember that still in the 1990s in Sweden and, and in Norway, we had uh, an electoral performance that was uh, uh, nearing or even uh, above forty uh, percent. Johan, juste, <coughs> moi, une. Euh, C'était juste pour signaler. Tu as peut-être débranché ta caméra euh, pour qu'on puisse te voir, à moins que tu préfères parler sans que l'on te te voit. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, sorry about that. Voilà. So merci beaucoup. Donc là, on te voit. Très bien. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. I was uh, just wa watching the slides and uh, not paying attention to my own, own image. Um, okay, so uh, let me go back a little bit uh, uh, on the nature of these uh, parties. As you know, they, they were uh, mass parties born in conjunction with uh, the workers' uh, movements and the trade unions, uh, there was a, a clear uh, conjunction between the, the, the strengths of the workers' trade union movements and, uh, and the parties. But uh, the parties were also born in, in a time when there were strong linked links with other types of uh, popular and social movements, such as cooperatives, uh, uh, sometimes the free church, but also teetotalers. The, the leagues against the consumption of alcohol and also adult folk uh, popular education that was uh, uh, very powerful in countries such as Denmark and also uh, Sweden. 
So they form together um, constellations and way into the 20th century. And what remains of, uh, of this history is probably uh, a strong, more or less strong link with uh, unions that are no longer just uh, working class trade unions, of course, but uh, they are also public service uh, employee uh, unions. Uh, it's probably in Sweden that we still have the strongest link, although it's uh, it's it's changing now at, at the moment. So I will come back to that um, later in the presentation. Um, this organic link with the social movements and with the trade union movements uh, uh, was profitable for the parties in terms of high memberships. Uh, but at the same time, we had to understand that, uh, um, well, these memberships were indirectly inflated by a kind of collective affiliation of trade unions uh, in Sweden and Norway, whereby if you belonged to, uh, to the working class trade unions, you were automatically uh, integrated as a member of the parties. And that was only uh, in the late 1980s that, that uh, this system of collective affiliation was terminated and, and we saw a, a very big, uh, big um, uh, dive in the, in the membership uh, figures. Yeah. Um, and and uh, it has continued to, to go down uh, uh, as it's the case is in most social democratic parties with some exceptions. I was mentioning the Labour, the British Labour Party uh, a moment ago and it's true that uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, well, there's a mass membership that has been revived with uh, uh, members in the 500,000s uh, uh, after 2015 and in, sh in a short amount of time. So it's still possible to have a, a kind of revival of the, the, the old mass, mass parties, although they, they function very differently from, from uh, before, but it's maybe not completely over. Um, but in any case, uh, in Denmark, where, when you didn't have this, uh, the same system of collective affiliation between unions and, and uh, the parties, we had a maximum of 300,000 members in the party in 1950, and it uh, went down to 35,000, so it's been divided by almost 10 in uh, 2019. That, that gives you an idea of where we are uh, standing now. Okay, so <clears throat> what, um, uh, what, what, what are the reasons? What can explain the decline, the electoral decline? I mean, you have been through probably most of the factors that explain that in other countries, in other cases, social, democ social democratic parties in, 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 uh, in the rest of Europe. But, um, but I, I want to stress a few, a few points here. Uh, among the reasons for for this decline, uh, and the decline was not straightforward. It was not linear. You had, as you could see uh, here on the graph again, you know, periods uh, with um, cr crisis that were that were temporary, and then uh, and then the parties went up again uh, in the electoral in terms of electoral performance. So, so you had you had cycles, but now over the last 10, 20 years, it seems to be going down more, more clearly. Um, so in Scandinavia, you used to have a, a core five-party system um, and a form of what uh, political scientist uh, from Norway, Stein Håkan, uh, called um, cleavage uh, uh, freezing until. Uh, the 1960s or 70s. That is, you had a system with two parties on the left, um, one former communist party, or communist or former communist, and the social democratic party, one center party, usually an ag agrarian type uh, of party, one liberal party that was also uh, leaning toward the center, and one conservative right-wing party. So that was the standard uh, picture of uh, of this five-party uh, system. And then uh, there's been a, a, a quite an amount of political renewal since the 60, 1960s and 1980s. So you had um, socialist uh, left uh, sessions, um, uh, especially um, in Norway, um, but also in Denmark to some extent. 
uh, as of the 1960s in Norway, for example, that was uh, based on the um, on the issue of NATO belonging to NATO and stationing of uh, of uh, weapons, nuclear weapons in Norway uh, through the membership was in in NATO. Um, so that led to to a split in the in the Social Democratic Party and a, in the splinter uh, social socialist left party. You had the birth of Christian parties and Christian democratic parties or Christian popular parties in in Norway in the 60s also and then later on in in Sweden. Um, there was the advent of uh, populist right wing and anti fiscal uh, parties in Denmark and, and Norway. They were both called progress parties at the beginning. Um, and they um, started their career in the 1970s. And later in Sweden, you had a similar type of party, the Sweden Democrat, that is uh, even more to the right and, uh, and more nationalistic. Uh, I will go back to that in a moment. You had uh, the creation of a Green Party in Sweden. So the effective number of parties have has gone up the roof in, in a way. So you have many more parties uh, today and new cleavages. Uh, all this have, has led to uh, increasing electoral volatility since the 1970s. And the, the beginning of that, that the, the warning sign was certainly the 1973 uh, earthquake elections in Denmark uh, when when uh, Dan Danish social, social democracy lost a, a lot of ground and and most of the mainstream parties actually uh, also because of the the uh, progress uh, party uh, um, and its uh, success but um, one of the issue that also led to uh, to this volatility and to the to fragmentation of uh, the political space was certainly the European, uh, the uh, the European issue, um, the, the, the tensions around Euro European membership or membership in the in the eurozone later as well, uh, and uh, as uh, since the referendum in Denmark and Norway in 1972, uh, the the cleavage around the Euro uh, around Europe has been quite quite strong in uh, most of these countries, except perhaps in Finland, because Finland had a different history of being, uh, well, uh, close to uh, its big neighbor during the Cold War, the USSR, and, uh, and did not have the option basically to become a member of the European Union. So when it's had the opportunity to do so in an after, uh, at the end of the Cold War, well, uh, Finland was probably the most enthusiastic country or Europhile country of, of uh, the region. Uh, but to some extent, this uh, enthusiasm has uh, dropped a little bit over time. Um, in any case, uh, it is clear that uh, uh, divisions around European membership have been quite strong within the social democratic parties themselves. Uh, and especially during the referendum uh, campaigns, I mean, uh, in Norway, the two referendum uh, in 1972 and 1994, uh, in Sweden as well, and the social democratic parties had to accommodate, um, you know, uh, partisans of uh, of uh, the European Union and and also their opponents, um, and that. Um, went all the way to 2003 when there was a 2002 and 2003 when there was a referendum on on the uh, belonging to the European um, uh, monetary zone for Sweden and um, as you know Sweden decided against that although it was uh, legally bound to to be part of uh, of the euro uh, as um, as part of the Maastricht um, uh, treaty but uh, the campaign for for the euro or against the euro was also very very divisive for not only for social democracy but for also for other parties and for the political uh, landscape more generally um <clears throat> okay so uh, increasing volatility um and um and a more sociological approach um could probably focus on the decreasing um 
union rates and unionization has been going down slowly. Uh, we, we had rates of unionization that were uh, reaching 80, 90 percent, uh, some 30, uh, even 25 years ago. And now we are, we are down to uh, 60, 60 or maximum 70 percent. Uh, in, uh, in, in Sweden. It's always been a little bit lower in, um, in Norway for different reasons, but it, it's, it's also on the way down. Um, so uh, union rates, uh, the fragmentation and uh, weakening of, of the working class, but also um, the fact that the public service that was a, a vote bank for, for uh, social democracy has been uh, fragmented and reformed to a large extent, and I will go back to that in a, in a moment. Um, in these countries, you have um, also polar opposites of uh, uh, government uh, formation and government uh, uh, systems. So, um, in a way, you have, on the one hand, Sweden and Norway, which were the most dominant with dominant stories of, uh, for, for social democracy and, and where um, uh, the parties got the, the best part of the vote for a long time. And there was um, um, a kind of uh, doctrine in these countries that the social democrats should uh, govern alone or not govern at all. They should be uh, heading the government without being part of a coalition. Uh, that was uh, a quite uh, interesting doc doctrine that, uh, uh, that made them uh, also a very special parties and they did not accept to form governing coalitions, although they did rely to some extent to, uh, uh, on parliamentary, informal parliamentary coalitions at times. Uh, you know, uh, for example, in Sweden, um, because the Swedish Social Democratic Party did not achieve a single majority on its own for most of the time, they had to rely on the small communist and then left party, which was ironically called Comrade 4%, because you, they needed 4% to pass the threshold to be part of parliament. And so it's well known that uh, you know, some social democrats voted for the comrade for 4% in order to keep, keep it represented in, the, in parliament so that uh, they, could, um, they could support uh, the social democratic uh, governments. Because you have such a system in, in Nordic parliamentarism that if you abstain and you don't vote against uh, a legislation, you are supposed to support it. So it's called uh, negative parliamentarism, and it's uh, also one of the reasons why uh, these minority governments could, could function. Uh, this dominant party doctrine was uh, broken in 2005 in Norway when there was an, a historical shift uh, in the direction of a coalition with the center party and the socialist left party. And it was uh, also broken later on in Sweden in 2010 when there was a political platform with the, the green and uh, the left party uh, that failed to win a majority. But then uh, later in 2014 and 2018, uh, the Social Democrats uh, relied on a formal coalition with the Greens. So you have you know, um, a, a dominant party doctrine that is now uh, a thing of the past in a way. And in the other uh, countries, in Denmark and also Finland, you have a very different system with um, minority governments most of the time and uh, reliance on uh, formal or informal coalitions in, in, in parliament. Uh, and and um, Denmark, in this respect, is one of the uh, record, record holder of minority governments in, in Europe. Okay, so um, the next um, question perhaps is um, what's left of the social democratic uh, ideology or program and how to what extent it has changed over time. It's a very big question and I cannot dwell on this uh, too much, but uh, 
I will uh, say a few things and we can certainly go back to that in the discussion if you have questions about this. And also in the, in the case studies that I will uh, go through in a moment of the different countries. So what's left of ideology? Um, that's, that's a bit of a, the one billion crown uh, question, I would say. Um, these parties, the social democratic parties, they've been clearly associated with the welfare state buildup in, in their uh, respective countries. Um, and, and a welfare state that, according to uh, Jostais being on the sun, uh, wrote uh, this famous book about the three worlds of welfare capitalism in 1990. This welfare state leans toward universalism. It's an encompassing welfare state within the perimeter of market capitalism, but uh, a welfare state that is uh, built on a strong public service with, um, with uh, a generous uh, coverage. Uh, it's insurance-based, um, but also um, tax finance to some extent, to a larger extent than other countries such as France, for example. Um, and um, uh, uh, this uh, this welfare state, this universal welfare state, has been the crown jewel to some extent uh, of of social democracy. And they, the social democratic party have been the uh, the keepers of of that legacy. But at the same time, they also uh, made clear that um, uh, um, the way to finance welfare provision and a generous welfare state was to have a strong uh, economic growth. And these social democratic uh, parties were also quite open to, um, uh, to um, promoting uh, uh, growth by any means and to, um, uh, to have uh, a dialogue and a constructive dialogue with uh, the business interests. Uh, in in each uh, in each country, there are other kinds of uh, of limits to this welfare state as being universal and insurance based. Uh, one of the limits, for example, is when you take the the um, unemployment insurance in Sweden and and Denmark and uh, and Finland as well. And the way it is organized, it is based on on the unions. Uh, the unions manage uh, the, the unemployment uh, insurance, and it's one of the only insurance that it's, it's not compulsory. It, uh, it is compulsory in, in uh, Norway, but it's not in the other countries, meaning that uh, you don't have a, a, a full coverage or universal coverage. And it's been one of the, um, uh, of the, the questions and, and the problems over time, especially with uh, newcomers from different countries uh, which, who did not have an experience of social insurance and of trade unions to the same extent. And, uh, uh, and you, we have seen over time a kind of um, gap in the coverage of unemployment insurance. That's one of the problems that, uh, that uh, uh, well, universal welfare states uh, in, in the Scandinavia have, have had to grapple with uh, over the last um, the last decade, um, <clears throat> another important thing in terms of this welfare buildup is that it's not just state; it's also municipal. Uh, local government plays a very very strong role in this history, and they administer uh, many of the social and healthcare services in the different countries. Uh, we can see that clearly now with the with the COVID nineteen crisis, but um, they also administer manage uh, old age uh, care services. Um, These municipal services have been real vote banks for the social democrats. Uh, it's uh, in the nineteen seventies that uh, the municipal service trade unions started, started to become larger than the traditional working class trade unions, such as the metal workers trade unions. And um, that was an interesting turn. And, you know, the municipal employees, they were always very much uh, uh, in favor of, uh, of social democrats. Now it's starting to change as, as well. And we have much more fragmentation, volatility and less um, 
fidelity or faith to, to, the, to the party. Um, these um, welfare state reforms that used to be very progressive, they have moved, as you know, in the 1980s, in the 1990s, and since then, uh, in a more liberal fashion. And we've had a series of, uh, of uh, uh, neo-managerial reforms that have opened up um, s social services um, to uh, um, an increasing number of private actors. And um, this, is, uh, this is quite, quite, quite important. Uh, uh, social and public services have been fiercely deregulated in Nordic countries, uh, opened up to private operators, not as much as in the UK, uh, but they have clearly been submitted to this neo-managerial doctrine. And the social democratic parties, they participated um, sometime under the, the objective of more decentralization. But um, for one example of, uh, of, of this uh, type of reform and restructuring is the uh, hospital reforms in these countries. And Denmark and Sweden, for example, have among the lowest numbers of hospital beds in the OECD right now. Uh, this is you know, an important factor that we, we can come back to if we discuss a little bit the current situation with the crisis uh, uh, of the COVID-19. Um, so private operators in nursing homes as well, um, uh, municipal governments, they have opened up uh, um, you know, contracts for private operators in, in most of these services. Um, you used to have a public service with a kind of lifetime employment. It's no longer the case. Um, so um, state public service employment has, has been reduced drastically. And now most of the public service employment is contracted uh, out in, inside the municipal governments. Also, to some extent, there's been a um, a greening, or maybe uh, I say, gr I wrote provocatively, greenwashing of social democracy. Um, they have moved this party toward uh, an inclusion of the environment in their program, but with a resistance of the of some of the industrial unions, for example. You know, in Sweden, you have uh, nuclear energy, nuclear power in Finland as well. You have, of course, the big factor of oil in Norway. Um, so to some extent, um, the par parameters of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, greening ha had to take into account uh, some of the big interests that were also at play in these countries. It is perhaps more evident, this greening in Denmark, because uh, because of the investment in renewable energy and uh, and the, the big champions of wind en energy that have, have been uh, created in uh, in Denmark, but um, but it's also to some extent uh, you you can also find find limits uh, to this um, to this uh, move toward uh, uh, more environmental policies. But it's clear that um, the fact that we don't have green parties in all these countries, you know, they don't have uh, um, all of them a green a party that is significant uh, is one of the reasons behind that is that uh, environmental uh, policies and environmental factors have been integrated in the political competition in all the parties. Um, so I was, yeah, I also uh, wanted to finish this slide on a, an, an, a, another provocative note because there's still so much discourse on on the Nordic model or Nordic branding and the fact that, um, you know, these countries, they feature so, so high on in uh, uh, rank international rankings of, uh, of uh, equality, of, uh, of uh, gender equality, welfare, health spending, uh, social coverage, uh, still, still as of today. But um, this discourse of the Nordic model has become, I was saying, you know, a kind of smorgasbord, uh, to use one of the famous uh, 
uh, word in, in the Swedish language, or a garbage can, which is also a concept that was invented by Norwegian sociology, uh, in the sense that we tend to put too many things into uh, these uh, ideas of, of model, and, and in the end, we don't know exactly what they mean. But it's true that, to some extent, uh, this idea of the Nordic uh, model uh, owes to, to um, owes uh, a lot to social democracy and uh, to this mixed bag of uh, welfare policies, but also um, uh, um, gender equality and uh, redistribution. Um, okay. Let me turn now to um, to the three cases into more uh, details, and I will uh, go from one country to the next and start with um, with Denmark. Uh, Denmark is um, is probably a good illustration uh, um, of uh, the new managerial reforms that I was mentioning a minute ago, uh, because in the 1990s there was um, this strong renovation and reform of the unemployment, the unemployment uh, system in, in Denmark. Denmark at the time had a, an um, unemployment rate uh, at about uh, 12%. And the Danish government of Paul Nierup uh, Rasmussen in 1994 introduced a new uh, reform that uh, moved um, uh, unemployment benefits toward a new system of activation. Activation that is after six months of being unemployed and you could be uh, eligible for uh, unemployment benefits for four, up to four years in Denmark at the time. Well, after six months, you had to go through uh, a system of activation and that you know, put some pressure on uh, uh, job seekers to uh, find a job, find training, or something like that. And so there were m increasing conditions uh, that were put, uh, introduced uh, on uh, this unemployment benefit system over time since the mid 1990s. So it led to recovery of employment in Denmark that was not just due to these reforms, it was probably also due to um, the recovery of uh, economic growth for in, in other respects. And it's, it was not just a consequence of this uh, activation reform. Uh, but um, what, what happened is that um, it clearly started um, a new trend and uh, an increasing uh, pressure on job seekers to uh, find a job, um, also an, an increasing pressure on street level workers who administered the system. Um, so in a way, this has become part of the new unemployment system in, in Denmark. Uh, and, and the last element of this is that we have reduced the rights for immigrants uh, to unemployment benefits uh, in the last uh, decades. And this is uh, very important because um, uh, it's, it's, it's actually important to stress to what extent uh, uh, Danish politics have been obsessed with uh, the issue of immigration over the last 20 years. And this has had an impact on the Social Democratic Party itself. Um, the Progress Party um, I talked about uh, some time ago that was born in the 1970s um, had a split in the 1990s and there was a new party called the Danish People Party that um, was born. And uh, it was a more radical party uh, in terms of its uh, stance on immigration and it had a huge impact on the political scene in Denmark and especially uh, on the liberal uh, right governments that uh, took place in the 2000s. Um, uh, the government of uh, Anders Fogge Rasmussen and uh, Lars Lecke Rasmussen. They, these governments, they introduced um, uh, a much stricter immigration policy 
And this uh, very strict uh, stance on immigration has been gradually also infused in the Social Democratic Party. Um, and that we can see clearly now in the current government of Mette Frederiksen, um, which is you know, an interesting combination. On the, on the one hand, Mette Frederiksen came to power with a program to uh, stop some of the public service reforms and new managerial reforms that went too, too long, uh, in, in her opinion. Um, to try to promote a better system of uh, pension and early pensions, for example. But at the same time, she clearly had a very strict uh, stance on immigration. And she has introduced with our government uh, project to um, uh, target what are called, officially called uh, ghettos in uh, the Dan Danish language. And... Uh, uh, these projects are to actually introduce more uh, mixity and more diversity in some of the uh, some of the neighborhoods that are uh, considered to be um, dominated by uh, immigrants um, and and uh, citizens or uh, foreigners uh, of citizens of foreign origins or or uh, or immigrants. So you had. Um, you had uh, uh, this kind of project, but also other projects of rep repatriation of uh, refugees uh, to their home countries and agreements with some, uh, uh, some countries in the Middle East or Africa in order to prevent uh, the, the influx of re new refugees. Uh, this has been a very, very clear shift in the, in the Social Democratic uh, Party that has come closer to to the parties of the right. And, and in Denmark, you have a, a kind of competition on the right now with the creation of new nationalistic parties such as New Burgerlige and, and Stram Kursch, uh, which are uh, parties that are even more extreme uh, and have not managed, managed yet to be uh, represented in parliament. But uh, this competition to be to have the strictest line on immigration is uh, is now quite clear in uh, uh, in Denmark, and you have this tendency to promote a welfare for for the Danish people, a chauvinist and uh, restricted welfare uh, for uh, only Danish citizens. Um, okay, so this was the. Um, some of the elements that I wanted to focus on for Denmark, and of course I cannot cover uh, every country in, in every case in more detail, but uh, I'm happy to come back to that uh, later on in the questions. So, um, let me turn now to, um, to the following country of Norway. Um, well, Norway... Um, is it also an interesting um, uh, country uh, in the sense that um, the magnitude of the change that took place in this country over 50 years is sometimes not well appreciated in foreign uh, eyes. Um, oil and gas resources that were found at the end of the 1960s led to heavy investments um, and, of a, and it led to a national strategy to, in the first place, socialize the resource uh, of oil with the creation of a, of a national champion that was called Statoil, uh, National uh, Oil Com and Gas Company. Uh, that strategy of socializing the resource hit the wall in the 1980s. Um, and they had to shift to a different uh, strategy into more privatization and more reliance on private actors. At the same time, uh, that was uh, when Norway and so the Social Democratic no uh, Party in Norway was building a high profile on environmental issues. You remember the Brundtland uh, report of 1987, and uh, uh, that was when the 
the notion of uh, sustainable development was coined by by Prime Minister, Social Democratic Prime Minister Gro Arlen Brutland. Um, and uh, so you had a strange combination of a country that was at the same time becoming one of the uh, richest oil producing country in Europe and in the world, and also building up its uh, environmental profile. Um, so uh, this strategy led to um, the, the buildup of an oil fund in the 1990s, uh, with an unprecedented growth of this fund in the late 1990s. Um, and uh, what is strange in, in Norway is, is that even though uh, so much money started to flow in in this fund and in the, in, in the, in the country, well, Norway, Norway has adopted similar welfare reform and employment reform policies as its neighbors, as if, you know, the oil money didn't matter so much. Well, of course, they have invested a lot in, in healthcare, in hospitals, uh, in the promotion of uh, better equipments and institutions. But at the same time, they also put a lot of pressure on uh, recipients uh, and, uh, and of, of benefits uh, on, uh, on the public service and the operation of the public service. And um, the people who, and the elite working in the oil industry also was recycled to some extent in the state uh, public service and in the state uh, political uh, elite. So you had very, very big connections between the two elites. One of the examples that I can mention is the 2002 healthcare reform that was made um, uh, in, in Norway. It changed the structure of healthcare organization and, and the structure of hospitals with the um, new uh, CEOs uh, at uh, the top of every health region and at the top of every hospital. And this uh, reform that was you know, clearly neo-managerial in its spirit was um, influenced directly and actually promoted by the Social Democratic Party and, and government at the time and by a health minister who was coming directly from the, from the oil industry. So you have you know, this kind of uh, uh, interesting relationships that are not always well known outside of, uh, of Norway. Um, another reason why uh, recently the Social Democratic Party in Norway has not been so successful is the fact that uh, the pro populist and right-wing progress party in Norway has um, managed to acquire a more, you know, um, a reputation that allowed it to become part of a governing coalition in 2013. So they were, for the first time in Norwegian history, part of this right-wing government uh, uh, led by Erna Solberg in 2013, and they stayed in power in coalition until 2019, when they were uh, in disagreement with the government and they and they and they quit. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the right-wing parties have been more successful. But there are other uh, internal reasons in, within the social democratic parties lately that can explain the, 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 difficult, the difficulties that uh, this party has met. Um, well, some of these difficulties are contingent, contingent to, to some extent. Some have to do with the with the divisions around the question of oil. Uh, in 2019, there was a very, very heated Congress in the Social Democratic Labour Party in Norway because the, the youth movement in the party was very much opposed to new exploitation of oil in the Lofoten uh, uh, island in the north of Norway. You know, you know these uh, very famous pristine islands of Lofoten, uh, the very, very big tourist attraction. And uh, the government had some projects to uh, start uh, exploring oil in this region. And, and actually, um, the Congress uh, had to vote against um, this, um, uh, this um, oil policy. And that was, uh, you know, the first time that they did so, but there was a very, and there is still a strong conflict between 
two generations within within the party. You know, in the eyes of um, Jonas Gar Stoder, who is the leader of the party, oil should be used by Norway because Norway is a democracy, uh, and uh, they can make better use of the resource. They can, for example, promote um, uh, the use of oil uh, money to uh, fund uh, reforestation, uh, uh, protection of the of the wild forest in in the Amazon, and actually Norway is one of the uh, strongest contributor of the UN programs to uh, to uh, keep these uh, forests alive. So, in the eye of of the leader, the party leader. It was important to continue um, uh, banking on on oil uh, and and compensating for the carbon footprint that uh, that Norway uh, had. But in the eye of the new generation, and it's not only in the Social Democratic Party, it's also in in the other parties. Uh, the new young generation is is also leaning much more toward a, a, a straightforward opposition. Uh, against uh, uh, more exploitation of oil and, and fossil fuel energy. Uh, so the low foot and crisis in 2019 was, uh, was one of the uh, key moment in this, um, in this uh, story. Okay, so um, I'm not going to be too long, uh, but I want to finish on, uh, on the, the Swedish case. Um, well, and I entitled uh, this uh, little story Social Democrats versus uh, Sweden Democrats. Uh, it is clear that in uh, uh, the last 10 to 15 years, there's a radical competition uh, that has started with a new party, the Sweden Democrats, uh, that has made inroads not only locally from its uh, thousand regions of Sweden where it was more powerful uh, into the rest of the country and nationally now reaching uh, almost 18 percent in the last election in 2018 and becoming the third largest party and it's now polling first party on a regular basis and uh, replacing the social democrats as the largest party in many municipalities across the country um, and uh, uh, this we can we can see uh, on a map on uh, here of the sorry of the strengths of the vote by municipality for the Sweden Democrats in 2018 and with the also three regions of uh, Göteborg, Malmö, and Stockholm on the side. And you can see where you know the blue areas are where the Sweden Democrats score their highest uh, with you know, scores that can go as high as, as 40% in some municipalities. So it's, uh, it's uh, a real strong growth, but it's also scoring higher and higher in the rest of the country in, in the north, but also in, in the area of Malmö in the south. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the, at the map for uh, social Democrats that have lost ground, or you can see, quite clearly that it still holds its bastions in the north, but you know, the north is not heavily populated. Uh, well, the Social Democrats have been weaker and weaker in the major cities, and, and they are replaced by, by right-wing parties or green party, uh, but they are also weaker in the most populated uh, part of the south, except in some, some localities. And uh, uh, if you look at this uh, table here, you can see between 1994, 1994 and 2018, how we have like a great replacement uh, of the Social Democrats, uh, you know, uh, nearly term on term, you're losing 17% uh, point of the vote. Uh, to uh, not always directly to the Sweden Democrats, but in the meantime, the Sweden Democrats have gained 17 uh, percent because they started from nothing. And and in in this period, the other parties they have not gained or lost so much. So now we have a kind of a, of a competition between between these these two parties. It's it's a real problem for building a government because so far. 
the Sweden Democrats have been excluded from a coalition platform, uh, being too nationalistic and too considered to be too extreme. But this um, containment, in a way, is uh, gradually falling down. And uh, what we see now, and for, for, for eight years in a row, are social democratic government that are uh, loosely supported by the right-wing parties in parliament. Uh, they don't achieve a majority and, and have to, uh, well, uh, make a policy on the terms of the right. And um, to some extent, this has led to a, uh, to a, a, a progressive split uh, open split within the Social Democratic Party itself that we see now with um, new movements growing up inside the party and especially a movement that is called the Reformist and it, that is um, going more to the left and is that is uh, uh, in favor of keeping a strong link with the unions. Whereas um, the paradox is that for the first time in the history of uh, Social Democratic governments, Stéphane Levin, the current prime minister, is um, coming from uh, a union background. He used to be uh, the head of the metal unions. But at the same time, he's not so much in favor of keeping a strong link with the trade unions. And he's playing much more a card uh, that is um, uh, favoring the business interests. In, and, and so we have, like, we're really at a, at, at a crossroad, and, and I want to go back to the, to the title, the initial title of this talk, uh, for the Swedish Social Democratic Party. You know, there's a real question of identity here. Where uh, is the party going? Is it going to go more in the direction of a lab Labour Party under Corbyn, for example? Or is it going to go in the opposite direction towards much more uh, cooperation with the right wing or center parties. And this is a, a still an open question. And of course, the Sweden Democrats, they are kind of um, arbiters in this uh, story. And they uh, have made a lot of, um, um, uh, um, well, <laughs> made a lot of signs uh, to try to attract the right-wing parties in Sweden to build a coalition. They are now ready to support a right-wing government uh, in, in parliament without entering a formal coalition, uh, which is what happened in Denmark 20 years ago. And that, that is what led Denmark to, to promote this uh, much stricter immigration policy. So, of course, with Sweden being... One of the countries that has um, accepted the most refugees and the most immigrants over the last years, especially after 2015, uh, along with Germany, by the way, well, um, uh, the immigration question has started to uh, have a higher profile in Swedish politics, and uh, it's uh, poisoning the, the political debate. But, but uh, uh, and I want to conclude on this. Of course, now, right now, it's not immigration that matters so much, it's COVID. Um, I don't want to um, spend uh, any time discussing uh, the COVID crisis because it would uh, lead us too far, but I'm very happy to discuss it in with you in the question session after that. Uh, there is, of course, a lot to be said uh, on the social democratic uh, policies uh, in the COVID crisis, and I'm actually writing a book at the present moment, on the, uh, called the Swedish experiment on on the on uh, how Sweden actually um, uh, deviated very much from the rest of the Nordic countries, but also from the rest of Europe on this uh, uh, strategy against the, the virus. So um, thank you. I, I want to conclude on 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 this uh, and and um, and open up for. For discussion um, um, and questions about about all all the issues that I've uh, put forward. Um, we have to uh, thank you very much, um, Johan, for this uh, very clear, very uh, specific, 
presses and uh, deconstructive uh, lecture of the uh, um, actual situation of the Scandinavian uh, social democracy as we were uh, conceiving the uh, program of our um, of our, sorry, our lectures for this uh, uh, for this spring uh, about the future of the social democracy we were very happy with uh, Matthias and Hans Jürgen uh, that we could close with a Scandinavian model because uh, we had uh, the hope uh, if the social democracy can resist then uh, in Scandinavian uh, and it was maybe a little bit uh, hope or light after uh, the continued uh, um, uh, impressions, very sad and depressive impressions of the crisis of the social democracy in Europe. But you showed uh, us uh, uh, certainly, and of course this legend uh, has to be uh, deconstructed uh, uh, too. Uh, so you finished and it was very interesting with the COVID crisis and uh, maybe with um, uh, the way uh, in which this uh, crisis um, uh, has to, um, uh, uh, to ask every country and every population about the resistance of the uh, welfare state, of the social system, of uh, uh, the medical uh, system. So uh, I would like to start maybe the discussion with uh, this question. Um, do you think or uh, can we believe the uh, populations, the countries of uh, the Scandinavian part of Europe are still convinced they build a specific situation in contrary to the other parts of Europe. So they uh, are still convincing uh, um, uh, there is a, a specific historical social model uh, nowadays or they are uh, believing no we are on the way of uh, a kind of normalization of europeanization and so on yes well thank you for the question that um, we will probably have to go back to the, the covid crisis late later on i didn't want to 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 dwell too much on, on to this because uh, I, I, I thought there would be questions inevitably that would uh, be raised uh, about this. But uh, on your more general question, I think they still believe, and the social democratic parties uh, themselves still believe that uh, uh, they are bearers of a specific uh, uh, model, um, universal welfare state, uh, based on uh, municipal government as well, and not just um, your state uh, organized. Uh, this is uh, actually an element that is uh, very important in the Swedish strategy against COVID, by the way. Um, and um, But they're also uh, more and more convinced that this model is in danger. And uh, this is to some extent what the Sweden Democrats and one, what other anti-immigration parties uh, like the Rassemblement National in, in France and other right-wing parties against immigration will promote the fact that uh, in order to safeguard this model and to be able to um, uh, direct enough resources toward uh, welfare provisions for every citizen uh, in, a, in tough times, you know, in global competition with other countries, that we have to restrain uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, immigrants that come into the country but it goes much further than this because it's also in an identity fight or a cultural fight. There is the idea behind uh, this model that um, um, uh, trust is the basic guarantee um, of uh, the welfare contract uh, and that people should not cheat, people should be uh, good citizens in many ways, they should um, pay their taxes and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is, um, you know, this kind of things, uh, this issue of trust that is put forward by the 
not only the anti-immigration parties, but but also by by the social democrats themselves in Denmark, for example, that we have um, to restore trust, to safeguard trust, uh, and uh, too much diversity, too much multiculturalism. You know, Sweden was one of the first countries in Europe to officially promote multiculturalism in the late 1970s. Um, this is some, this this has gone too low, too far, and too long uh, in the eyes of uh, of uh, m- many of of, of uh, the the defenders of this uh, model. But of course, it's again um, not everyone agrees with that. And you and I mean Sweden is a good example uh, of a country where the fight is still going on perhaps a bit more strongly than in the other countries, especially in regard with immigration. And where this kind of uh, uh, you know, idea of building a, a uh, pure welfare state without uh, um, immigration and without diversity is something that is not uh, yet accepted by, by everyone, uh, far from it. So you have a cultural and also socio-economic uh, battle that is going on and the two, the two are uh, joined together in a way. Thank you, Johan. Uh, so I can open the discussion with the other participants. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, use the function uh, raise the hand uh, when you want to discuss with us or to ask a question to Johan. Um, who wants to uh, to begin the discussion. Uh, First question to Jan, Hans-Jürgen. Yeah, well, uh, thank you again, Jan, for this uh, inspiring uh, tour d'horizon, which will indeed contribute very much to our uh, comparative debates and our series and among ourselves. Uh, It is obvious, of course, as you have indicated in the beginning, Uh, that the Scandinavian uh, Social Democratic parties share all the general tendencies of party change and transformation of the good old uh, uh, catch-all parties, uh, like the erosion of traditional milieus, the uh, more fragmentation, uh, 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 weakness of the traditional modes of organization, trade unions, etc. Uh, higher volatility, falling rates of participation. Uh, we, kn- we, we know all that. But on the other hand, uh, uh, they uh, uh, show some specifics of the Scandinavian situation, as you also have uh, indicated. And I wonder whether this could be uh, systematized a bit, uh, a bit more, whether we could put it in a more systematic uh, way And uh, for that, I have about two or three questions. First, is there still a Scandinavian, do you think whether or not there still is a Scandinavian type of social uh, democracy? On the one hand, we have the different trajectories of the parties for more than a century. Uh, On the other hand, we have some Uh, 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 common characteristics. And uh, uh, the question is whether the common characteristics uh, dominate the different trajectories or it's the other way uh, around. And this may change in different periods, as we all know. And so my question would be, do you uh, think that there still is a Scandinavian type? Or, uh, uh, well, was was there ever one? Uh, That would be an additional uh, question. And what would be the essential characteristics of such a type. We could define, let's say, the Central European type. We could define the Southern European type in a way, and the British type, of course, because it's just one party. Uh, uh, But it's a bit more difficult in the Scandinavian case, uh, I think. You have mentioned at some point, well, two clusters and certain questions, Denmark and Finland on the one hand, and uh, Sweden and Norway on the other. But when it comes to, uh, let's say, that would be my second point, uh, the uh, uh, role of the different constellations of the new competitors uh, with regard to what then happens to the social democrats when they have 
uh, to react, then of course it may make uh, more of a difference whether you have populist parties around like in Denmark and Norway or uh, whether they are not uh, so powerful. Uh, and what about what about uh, Christian parties, Green parties? So, uh, would you, uh, which weight would you give to the particular constellations of the new competitors with regard to the reactions and the further development uh, and the political chances, of course, of the social democrats? And this brings me to my last uh, point: other factors which may be. Uh, uh, triggering uh, uh, differentiations among uh, what once was seen as kind of the Scandinavian uh, type may also have to do with the relationship between the traditional social cleavages and the new cultural or ideological cleavages like uh, uh, cosmopolitanism against communitarianism. And here the, the Swedes with their highly ideologized uh, version of the, of the Volksheim, of the folk, uh, Volkerhammet, uh, 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 may also make a difference in comparison to other countries where this is not uh, played uh, so uh, high. And of course, migration here also makes a big uh, difference. Okay, I'll leave it at that, uh, I would have another question. Uh, well, what could save them? We'll come back to that, I, I suppose. Thank you. Uh, many interesting uh, points here um, that we have to take us back in, 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 into, into history uh, quite a long time. But, um, but I would say um, uh, the first question, uh, was there ever a Scandinavian type of social democracy? We can try to answer that question. Well, if there was a type, I think it was, um, first of all, uh, based on the organic and very strong relationship with the trade unions. Uh, but the, the problem comes that, you know, that organic relationship was not as high in Denmark as it was in Norway and Sweden, uh, because the way uh, Danish trade unions were organized was, was quite different from, from uh, the industrial structure in the other countries. Uh, so you had, and I mean, you had already uh, ingrain a different uh, type of Danish uh, social democracy that was uh, not as much uh, tied to to unions, although they were clear clear links with the trade trade unions. But I would I mean say that uh, this link with union uh, has been uh, important, essential. It is really at stake now in the future of the parties, and especially in Sweden, it's been discussed very much. It has a lot of impact. Uh, on the kind of uh, employment, labor legislation, uh, labor rights uh, uh, that you promote, that these parties have promoted over time, the kind of welfare legislation on, on a more general uh, plan that they have uh, promoted. Um, and the other, the other uh, indicator, I would say, of a Scandinavian type is perhaps not so much Scandinavian, but I would say that's the universal welfare state. Uh, and that the, 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 the promotion of a, of a welfare state that was based on citizenship in the first place, that was heavily tax financed, and that, that was in the program of the, of the parties. But then again, you could have, as I said, uh, limits or exclusions to, to this kind of a universal uh, coverage. And, and, and again, uh, employment insurance, unemployment insurance was uh, uh, very much based on, on on union uh, power and and not so much uh, on on the classical uh, insurance universal insurance uh, uh, basis, but um, these two um, pillars I would say have been quite important to some extent. They are still here. I mean, we still they they are, they are not just traces of that. They have left a structural impact on the the what we could call the social democratic regimes, uh, but these regimes. Uh, they are um, clearly shaken to their feet right now. It's, it's something that has been going on for a long time, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it, the, the crisis is probably most severe uh, right now. Um, uh, I, I 
deliberately insisted on the differences between the, the cases and the countries, because I think there's a tendency to put them um, all in one bag. And uh, one of the things that you usually amaze me is, is that we don't take into account the, the degree of changes that have happened in the, the Norwegian economy, for example. That's, uh, um, you know, uh, almost no other European countries has, uh, has uh, experienced such a change, such a dr drastic change in, uh, over the last, uh, last half of, of century. Uh, so that's why I wanted to insist on, you know, how oil and uh, oil interest played in in the special uh, uh, um, issues and, and, and uh, political uh, quarrels and divisions in Norway and, uh, and, and why immigration was so important in, in Denmark and, and perhaps uh, also now in, in, in Sweden. Um, so that leads me to your second question of the, the new uh, competitors and, uh, and the constellations. Of course, this has changed a lot also in the in, in, in the recent uh, in recent times, because for a long time Sweden didn't have a, a populist right wing party. Uh, they had a green party, okay, but they, their party system was much more stable than the others uh, in Denmark and Norway, and uh, that explains to a large extent why uh, well the social democrats could um, be spared until the early 2000s uh, in the political competition. Now the now the rules of the game uh, is looking very, very different uh, in Sweden as well, uh, and it's uh, and the changes are taking place quite, quite uh, fast. Uh, what's also striking is the degree of um, volatility in the parliamentary uh, um, scene. Uh, now in Norway, for example, you have the center former agrar agrarian party that is. Uh, almost skyrocketing in the opinion, opinion polls, uh, uh, polling at uh, more than 15%. It's never been seen since the, the 1960s. And, uh, and, and it's very hard to explain why. You know, one of the reasons is that they have started to, well, um, take some of the same issues uh, as the Progress Party and the Populist Progress Party was uh, was uh, was um, uh, mobili mo mobilizing on uh, recently. So you have a, a very unstable uh, con const political constellation, political alliance uh, um, uh, seen in every country. I mean, I was mentioning in Denmark the fact that you have new uh, in new um, competitors on the right. Uh, on the extreme right, the nationalist uh, parties, Stram Kurs, uh, uh, and uh, the, the new, uh, um, the new, uh, new Borgelige. Uh, these are new parties. It's it's hard to to see what what their uh, future will be made of. But uh, we are uh, seeing clearly a more fragmented political scene and a more unstable scene. Uh, although uh, these democracies seem to be more stable than others, perhaps, uh, from a distance. And, and, and this, well, well I guess, uh, opens up to, the, 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 to your third questions on the, on the cleavages. I mean, uh, I, I would be ready to insist a bit more on the differences between each country in terms of, of cleavages. Uh, but now there's also a kind of normalization, and Finland is also in this uh, uh, story get, getting closer to the rest of the Nordic countries with one strong populist uh, party uh, actor, uh, not dictating, but at least influencing very much the, the ag political agenda uh, and, um, and, and, and also the kind of governments government platforms that can be, be uh, constructed in, uh, in, these, in these countries. So, I have uh, two another um, um, announce of a question. First, uh, from uh, a fellow in uh, a colleague, um, Dave Agostinho, uh, if I don't uh, uh, if I'm not uh, wrong. Oh. 
Hi, uh, I don't have a camera. I'm sorry. I I would I loved your presentation. It was really clear, and I would like to ask something, especially related to Denmark. Um, I've lived there, so it's a very interesting country to me, especially because uh, what we see, it's like. Um, the, this uh, idea of trust, but actually I think this happens to be the contrary in Denmark, is more the idea of fear and psychological politics, what happens there. It's in, in such a degree that to make sure, for example, immigration doesn't happen or the social welfare doesn't reach so far to help immigrants, they actually resort to a far right uh, kind of politics, but they also resort to a support of like a neoliber neoliberal uh, politics in the sense that they believe at least by their narrative that in a neoliberal society, of course, uh, the immigrants would not survive and to break down the ghettos into more harmonic, um, social spheres in Denmark, they, they could use this new liberal uh, politics. It's by this sense, we could see, I was there at the time, we could see that Denmark didn't actually voice negative um, judgments against Donald Trump, for example. It supported uh, Trump for almost the whole presidency. And the worst you could see was neutral positions, but mostly positive positions. So I was thinking about uh, the politics of fear that happens in Denmark. Of course, they have the fear, it's like ingrained on the idea that if a social, the social welfare reach, reach too far, so the Danish people will lose by the redistribution. Immigration is an obsession, of course, as you said, the new Bali uh, party there, it's a very interesting one, say things that I didn't think at this stage in history we could hear. But then what happens in Denmark, it's so sudden that it's happening for so long and it doesn't seem like very, very strange to us. But when it happens in other countries like the United States had, had a far right government, Brazil is having one, Venezuela, it's in between. And we think this is, oh, history is taking a turn, but Denmark is taking a turn like for 30 years now, more or less. And the last 20 years have been very based on fear politics and the psychological politics. So I, I just wanted you to comment on fear instead of trust not only for Denmark, but especially for Denmark. I thank you for your presentation. It's really, really clearly uh, stated and uh, I enjoyed hearing you. Thank you. Uh, it's a complicated, complicated question, this uh, issue of the relationship between, you know, uh, the positive uh, values of trust and uh, and uh, the negative values of, uh, of fear and resentment for the others. And um, um, yeah, to some extent it is uh, one of the, um, you're probably right to insist on the, the fact that, um, that uh, Danish governments uh, in pushing for a stricter line on immigration they have relied on, on this uh, fear factor um, over the last uh, 20 years. It was not so, so much the social democrats themselves, but the social democrats, they have they have um, gone in the same direction. It is just a little bit later. Uh, now you don't have so much of a conflict inside social democracy itself. Uh, and the support for um, this kind of policy is quite uh, overwhelming. I mean, you have some movements, uh, you have some disagreements, and you have some social movements out also out of, there in society that are um, trying to promote more solidarity and and uh, and, uh, and policies that are more respect respectful uh, and more open uh, of of uh, immigration than than what's the what the current government is is doing, but um, but 
But yeah, I'd, I don't know what to say really about uh, this uh, fear factor, but it's clearly a, a strange combination, uh, if I understand well what you said, of both you know, promoting uh, trust on the one hand, and uh, and promoting distrust on the other, um, you know, the fact that you don't, you cannot trust the other. But but the way I see it is that, is that um, 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 people or people are have been afraid um, of uh, losing that kind of uh, uh, trust between uh, each each others, and um, uh, perhaps. Uh, um yeah the mm, well i'm not sure what you had to conclude on this one i'm sorry <laughs> that's yeah the maybe maybe some someone someone wants to to uh comment on on this but but I'm, yeah it's 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 complicated yeah. may i thank make you for a your, shot your May I make a short zwischenruf, Pierre? Yes, of course, and and uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, I found uh, David Agostinho's uh, observations very enlightening uh, because they reflect uh, the this the uh, contraposition of uh, trust and fear exactly reflects what we are debating in uh, in. Uh, in our research on political parties uh, as the uh, juxtaposition or contraposition of positive and negative partisanship. And the more populist the style of our politics becomes at the moment in all Western countries, the more uh, negative partisanship is on the rise compared to uh, positive partisanship, which in good old social democratic times was called solidarity. Yeah, and, and and I mean this this idea of solidarity with the rest of the world, uh, uh, being open to uh, uh, you know, uh, political refugees, uh, is something that you know, used to be also. Then Denmark uh, used to be one of the countries that was m one of the most open to uh, refugees back in the early '80s. It had one of the most liberal legislation in terms of uh, of uh, uh, asylum at at the time. Uh, and they have made a, a, a complete U-turn on, uh, on, on this in the span of, uh, of 30 years. Uh, you know, uh, Sweden, to some extent, has resisted a little bit more, but it's now undergoing the same kind of, uh, of problems that uh, Denmark went through uh, in, in 20 years ago, and, uh, and and at full speed, I would say. In Denmark, what mattered as well, and I think the, the comment mentioned that um, uh, just before, is the fact that there was this, uh, uh, Denmark was part of the coalition with the US in, in Iraq, and there was also, uh, you know, a strong uh, pro-NATO stance and, uh, um, and, 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 uh, 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 Anders Fogh uh, Rasmussen, uh, who was the prime minister that promoted this, uh, this strict line on immigration, was also the one that uh, went uh, along with the US uh, in, in Iraq that caused a lot of uh, problems to Denmark. I mean, you remember the, 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 the scandal of the cartoons in 2005 that, uh, and the attention that caught uh, worldwide. That was also something that fragilized them. The consensus in Denmark uh, a lot, and that uh, uh, polarized uh, the issue of immigration around Islam uh, and again around uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalism uh, at the time. And since then, uh, clearly, it's been uh, it's been the case with with uh, this, this focus, uh, overwhelming focus on on Islam, uh, uh, whether it is in Norway, Sweden, or or then Denmark, but but also but also Finland. Although Finland doesn't have a, such a strong history of immigration, except uh, you know immigration from the neighboring countries. So that's also interesting how a populist party can mobilize so much on the issue of immigration in a, a country that is actually uh, very very little concerned by 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 immigration right now. 
Our second uh, asking speaker is uh, Matthias. Yes. Thank you, Johan. Yeah, I learned a lot uh, and you gave us a very clear picture of the whole, even if it's, it, we have to recognize the differences with uh, the national histories and constellations, geographic and uh, in the history of the self-organization of uh, each society and the uh, political tradition. But um, I, I would like to uh, uh, propose a kind of resume for something like a general tendency, which uh, is provoked by your own uh, um, presentation and uh, asking you whether or not this is something you had in mind or you would not agree with and, uh, and uh, in both cases, why? Um, I learned uh, the political outcome of elections and constellations in parliaments and uh, building uh, governments um, and in doing so, uh, formulating politics um, has been deeply uh, infected or changed or imposed by societal uh, developments from the 60s on to until today. Societal, that means we have a move within the societies from a more, let me say, social integrated model of welfare uh, and the integration of people in traditional structures of life, families, agriculture, and even uh, trade unions and uh, solidarity um, uh, you could uh, experience there um, as a, a kind of common shared values and organization in, in political uh, issues towards a more individual way of living, style and economy. Uh, that is uh, the first move. Uh, it is reflecting the economic logic of certain developments uh, as well. It's not just in societal or cultural, but um, it is part of uh, something which has cultural and economic um, sources or roots. And secondly, um, the second move is the more global economies develop, uh, the local developments being integrated in much more global structures, world market and the uh, effects, um, the less uh, willingness we can, uh, this is a paradox, uh, see in the same population to accept uh, the global constellation of the uh, labor move, uh, export of labor to other places, um, and the uh, move of, of people following the capital move um, and living in different countries, especially in situations of crisis where refugees they come in as an impact of globalization and not only global economies, but global politics as uh, one of the consequences of this complex uh, development of globalization. So, and in social democracy is reflecting in each party in different ways, uh, the difference in the culture of each society uh, towards these uh, very special um, problems uh, we are uh, confronted with. And the more fear one has, the more likely a person is going to the far right in order to protect something which seemed to be secured in the past. But if we uh, observe it more correctly, it is uh, a wrong uh, conclusion. Um, but nevertheless, it is influencing uh, the actual uh, vote uh, and politics. And um, the, if that general picture is somehow not totally wrong, what could uh, 
the social democratic old left answer be as a new left for the future to address these problems uh, and to overcome uh, the political uh, and the racist and the nationalist uh, tensions uh, which are obvious um, in not only the northern countries but uh, all over the globe and especially in Europe um, in France in Germany uh, in other countries thank you excuse me for being too long no no not at all it's it's just that uh, it's a very very big question uh, I don't know if I can have the resources to to answer that uh, in a straightforward way but um, but well, I think you're uh, you're right in, in many ways about about your your um, uh, diagnosis of uh, of this situation and uh, this evolution uh, towards uh, more individualism although uh, I would say that perhaps uh, the Scandinavians are known for this uh, strange combination of uh, you know what's Lars Tregord uh, once called uh, statist individualism uh, and the fact that uh, they have they are among the most individualistic people uh, we can find but they have find found a kind of antidote in collective uh, action and uh, and and large uh, organizations such as unions or uh, cooperatives or whatever, uh, and 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 be able to to do things together in a way. Uh, so the antidote may have its limits, and it you know, may also have its limits in the contemporary world, where these large organizations are also changing uh, a lot. I mentioned the unions. I think I think they still play a, a very big role in these countries. I mean, when you have around 60 or more than 60 percent of people who are members of unions this is much more than any other country in europe much more than france that uh, st stands at about eight percent uh right now uh in in and and much more than germany too um, um and and this is important because uh you know what is at stake uh and we could see that clearly um in the in the corbyn uh, episode in 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 Britain um, is is the the possibility of uh, building coalitions uh, beyond just politics, but also with organisations that are uh, representing one one part of society, one part of the economy, and um, uh, to some extent, this is I would say what what uh, the socialist in Spain did when they. They passed this agreement with uh, with Podemos, that was uh, the political uh, expression of uh, of all the movements, uh, some of the movements, uh, Indignados, and uh, that uh, started at the time uh, um, against uh, after the crisis. Um, you probably didn't have the same the same uh, um, uh, well. This, this, the same phenomenon in, in Scandinavia, but you still have some kind of stability in uh, these relations and in the, uh, the, the uh, strengths of some, some uh, encompassing organizations that uh, bring uh, some stability to the, to the welfare contract. Uh, a lot has changed. These are among the countries that have reformed their welfare structure uh, most actively of the last uh, 20, 30 years. But at the same time, they started from a level of uh, coverage, equality, redistribution, um, uh, unionization that was so high that you still have remnants of that and, and significant remnants, I would say. Um, and, and as you see, and th th that partly answers your question, I would say, as you see, you know, uh, Corbyn was very much a, a man of the past in that sense. It, it was very, very interesting to see Corbyn at the peak of this new movement with uh, um, uh, new uh, uh, campaigns to uh, promote, uh, this, to safeguard the NHS uh, and also the Millennium Movement uh, and, and all kinds of movements that, uh, that attracted a new generation of people as well. Uh, and brought you know, so many new mem members into this, uh, this party. Um, I guess the social democrats in Scandinavia, they have not found the recipe for 
that mobilization uh, so far and the way they're going, the direction they're going, trying to compete on the immigration uh, issue and on the identity issue with the other right-wing uh, parties is, is altogether the wrong, wrong way to go, in my opinion, but uh, that's, um, uh, that's only my opinion. Um, so what should they do? Uh, I'm, I'm quite convinced that they should try to uh, rejuvenate and rebuild some of the parts of the some parts of the social contracts that are still in place you know the fact that you have so many public services even though they might be contracted out to private uh, actors in the municipal uh, government um, uh, the fact that you have uh, you know a, a, a unions and collective agreements uh, that have been heavily liberalized and decentralized as well but they still exist and this is you know the way to go, in my opinion, try to solidify uh, this. And when you see the debate within the Swedish Social Democratic Party right now, uh, you have a clear example of that, the two possibilities. You know, one is going in the direction of uh, keeping the and, and building on, on the old pillars, uh, trying to make them to to make them visible for, for people and 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 explain that well, this is their way to security, and this is their way to uh, to uh, ha having a, a, a society ba based on solidarity and and and, and security. But um, but I'm not sure they will manage to do that. <laughs> um. Thank you, Johan. Uh, is there uh, any other question to? Be asking um, Johan if it is not the case. And if, uh, if if I if I may, I'm I'm yeah. surprised that no question on COVID was asked. Yes, yeah. you, <laughs> you announced uh, um, uh, uh, a point of view or a, a short analysis uh, on this uh, on this crisis. Uh, do you want to make it short now? Uh, in uh, well, I can certainly say a yeah. few things about it. I mean, especially on the case of uh, the divergence between, uh, you know, uh, well, they are not all social democratic governments, uh, but uh, but Denmark, uh, Sweden, and and Finland had very very different uh, policies. Uh, it's uh, still a very very big puzzle to understand why the Swedes did it that way. Uh, this is the, the thing that I'm trying to explore at the moment. It would uh, probably take us too far, but uh, it will have an impact on the image of the Social Democratic Party, uh, the Social Democratic capacity to, uh, to stay in government, you know, the way they will come out uh, of this crisis. So far, I mean, they, their legitimacy has been not so much eroded, uh, it's it's on the way down now, but uh, you know the prime minister, the government, they they enjoyed um, approval rates in the 40% uh, most of the time. Now it's going down, um, and uh, and we will have to see uh, at the end of the crisis when 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 this hopefully ends uh, the the kind of uh, of uh, um, <clears throat> justification that. Uh, that uh, can be made for all the human losses that have uh, been suffered uh, um, throughout 2020. Uh, because, of course, if you compare Sweden in terms of, uh, well, I would not like to say performance, but if you compare it to France, for example, that went through successful uh, six, um, consecutive lockdowns, uh, very strict lockdowns, well, Sweden, does, Sweden doesn't compare so, so badly. I mean, we have uh, approximately... Uh, the same mortality rate, uh, it's even uh, lower in Sweden than in France. Uh, but if you compare it to, to the neighbors, to, the, to Denmark, Norway and Finland, and uh, the comparison, it's much, more, much less favorable for, for uh, Sweden. And, and um, um, uh, the interesting thing is that Sweden has uh, steadily tried to defend its, its policy uh, on the basis that it was the way to go and it was uh, the democratic way to go. I'm not saying the social democratic way to go, but that was um, in agreement with the um, 
the crisis management uh, system, uh, the division of work between politics and uh, bureaucracy, expert bureaucracy, and and that um, uh, uh, that they did not have um, a a legislative. Uh, uh, resources that uh, they don't have a state of emergency in peacetime in Sweden that uh, made it possible to to actually implement uh, uh, very severe lockdowns. Um, in the end, it would have been possible to um, to do so. And what we see in Denmark, Norway, is that they managed to pass emergency emergency legislation very quickly in order to uh, to uh, uh, implement uh, lockdowns. Uh, it was more difficult to, to, to do in Sweden, probably, but there was also a policy of the health agency uh, to promote this kind of, uh, of non-lockdown policy, non, no mask mandate as well. Uh, it looks very strange in foreign eyes. Uh, there, uh, the, the, the fact is that it's been supported most of the time by by the government uh, and also most of the time by the rest of the political spectrum, except perhaps the Sweden Democrats again, uh, that were the most opposed. Um, so it's probably hard to, um, uh, in a few minutes, just uh, tie it up to, to the issue of social democracy, but it's clear that uh, uh, behind this uh, health crisis, this uh, pandemic, you have uh, uh, very deep questions about the kind of welfare and healthcare organization that uh, is going to be needed and promoted in order to fight against uh, potential future uh, crisis of this kind. And in, 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 uh, in this sense, it's quite interesting to see that there is not so much debate in Sweden about uh, you know uh, investing more in healthcare, investing more in in uh, hospital beds, uh, trying to limit the uh, the reorganization of the healthcare system that has been so intense uh, over the last uh, 15 year, years, um, and there is no no debate on on this, uh, um, and it's. Uh, Quite interesting to to see that compared to the debate we have maybe in France or other countries uh, on the, on the need to um, to invest in in welfare in order to prepare for uh, for this kind of crisis. So it's uh, um, the social democrats they have not been very prominent in the debate uh, on future issues. Uh, when we come out of this crisis, what will we, will we need in terms of, uh, of uh, what type of welfare state we will, will we need? Is it the type of welfare state that Sweden has promoted so far? Or is it something completely new that we have to rethink in a way? And um, this debate has not, has not been uh, going on at all. Thank you very much. Uh, you have a, a, a wide and uh, comparative uh, field uh, uh, about the management of uh, COVID between Scandinavia and uh, Europe. So we can see that. And uh, in, in turn of uh, Scandinavia uh, uh, between the uh, different uh, countries. Uh, so we will be very curious about your conclusions uh, after the uh, deeper examination of uh, this management. So uh, I think considering uh, the time we can, uh, we can conclude uh, with it and uh, we can thank you very, very much, uh, Johan, uh, for this lecture. Uh, it was really the best uh, way uh, we could conclude uh, the series of uh, these lectures in the spring and in this uh, summer. And uh, before we uh, are leaving, uh, I give uh, the word to uh, Matthias Lutzbachmann. Uh, he would like to propose a short, uh, a short appreciation or uh, evaluation of our series. <laughs> Matthias. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Johanna Kant, for this, I would say, perfect 
presentation. It was perfect in so many respects, uh, clear, transparent, differentiate, and without uh, leaving out uh, some generalities, so to speak, we already have been uh, uh, confronted with when we in the recent weeks talked about Great Britain or Southern European countries like Spain, Portugal, Italy, or Greece, um, as well as uh, discussing the topic of social democracy uh, in the Middle East uh, of Europe. These has been uh, the different topics um, of our summer semester uh, reflections. We started with an analysis of social democratic parties and present situation in Austria, Germany, and France. Parti Socialiste, uh, SPD, and SPÖ. And um, from there, uh, we developed uh, the picture, so to speak, uh, towards uh, the main, not all, but most interesting for us uh, European countries. This was not only an excursion, so to speak, on actual politics and societal developments and probably future uh, uh, conflicts in politics. Uh, but it was, uh, first of all, in itself a European experience, not only to have uh, these uh, presentations, but we made this uh, series of, uh, of lectures uh, possible in a European constellation of cooperation. It was the cooperation within the Forschungskolleg Humanwissenschaften between Goethe University and the EHES, Ecole des Auditudes Sciences Sociales, presented by Pierre Monet and tonight by you, and further other speakers. Though we started on that basis. A European project asking where is social democracy staying and what can we expect and why is what we see as a matter of fact um, has developed in the last 60, 70 years since World War II. Our interest is not an interest of historians, which is nice but and important, but our main interest was and is still focused the question for the future. Is there not only social democracy in Europe, in different European countries, but is there a European social democracy thinkable, possible? That means a transformation of national politics into uh, something new, addressing the general problems which are present in all countries in different ways, but more or less uh, present and uh, actual uh, for all of us, uh, confronted by not only the climate change, but globalization, world developments, uh, the uh, de development of capitalism and uh, societal consequences, ways of living, information, and uh, so many aspects. Where is Europe? and the political parties in Europe, the, the will for democracy and social integration by statal and municipal uh, constellations, which makes a difference to the American uh, model of democracy. Where is the old question of democracy um, in America, but democracy in Europe uh, uh, going uh, in the next years? and which role may, can, and should probably social democracy play in that field for the uh, future of this continent as part of a solidarian uh, community of nations and politics in the globe. And this is, of course, a very big picture now, but this is much 
precise uh, uh, definition of our interest of research. And from there we started. And we would like to continue in new ways and new forms. And COVID-19 gave us a possibility via online uh, presentations, which was not common for us uh, two years ago, uh, to invite speakers from different places. And we had no problem to understand each other mutually and found a common language to discourse, to analyze, and to debate. But of course, uh, time will come when we meet again in person and uh, we have to and will continue. And um, so far, I think all uh, reference, uh, my dear colleagues, Hans Jürgen Pule from Goethe University and Pierre Monet from AHSS and the Frankfurt based uh, Institut uh, Francais, uh, Franco Allemand. Uh, 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 from Fort, um, a, uh, the team behind the scene uh, in the Badenburg uh, based uh, Forschungskolleg uh, for Südelity, for Koban, and Schimmer, and all the others who made this uh, transmission possible. And I can announce uh, it's the last point, otherwise, I'm too long. Um, we will try to bring all the speakers and intellectuals and the participants again, somehow together in, in, in new ways uh, we will talk about, um, we will continue and we will have probably one or two final discussions. We will invite Hans Timmermans from the uh, European Parliament, the Social Democratic uh, parties here, to make a statement uh, in the direction I mentioned, and we will have probably, hopefully, uh, a roundtable discussion, one or two uh, in presence uh, with uh, people responsible for politics, not only with academics, uh, in order to discuss uh, these issues deeper and deeper. I think for an analysis of the situation, we brought forward something which is somehow unique. Um, I haven't learned so much in the past 12 months, uh, only through these lectures. Um, and um, I'm very thankful for that experience, which uh, implies uh, new possibilities to think about the actual and future uh, political solutions to the problems we are confronted with belonging to our life world. Um, and insofar, we have to address these problems. If we are not willing, and this is my personal statement, to let the right, the populist movement take over uh, majority politics, um, neither in France nor in Germany, nor in any other country um, of the future, uh, which is the, our responsibility. So thank you. And thank you for this wonderful evening, Johan Ogland, again. I'm very glad to be part of it. Thank you. Merci beaucoup encore. Et bonne soirée à toutes et à tous. Und wiedersehen und äh, bis bald. Äh, es wird äh, eine Folge geben, offenbar. Gut. Johann. Merci, Johann. Merci. Viel Spaß. Merci. Ja. Danke.